Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James grounded family Bible study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Numbers chapter 8. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and say unto him. Now it's funny, because when we when we done Leviticus and Numbers, it says, The Lord spoke unto Moses. And then the other places say, The Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron. But there are places when God said, the Bible records, God spoke unto Moses, and go tell Aaron. This is how faithful Moses is. Because what we're setting up is going to be the future nation of Israel. It has to be recorded. It has to be done. It has, they have to check the book and make sure everything they're doing is correct. It was not, you know, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, right to divine the word of truth. If a priest did not do what God expected them to do or do outside, you look at Aaron's son, boom, they're gone. They're dead. Moses is the writer of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He is up on the mountain and he is recording everything that God is telling him. Now, why does it say, and the Lord spoke unto Moses Aaron sometimes? God spoke with Moses, go tell Aaron. Mo Aaron's not there. And there are times where Moses is and Aaron is by his side. And these times when you see in this probable assuming, I mean, he said, speak unto Aaron, could be the times that when Moses is up on a mountain between him and God. And I, I don't know how it's going. I don't know how he is dictating. And God would say something. And it will say, okay, I want you to go down and I want you to specifically tell Aaron or this person. And it, when Moses is recording, Moses is not going to write and the Lord spoke unto Moses saying. That's not what God said. God didn't say, speak on, I'm speaking unto you, Moses. Uh, you're speaking unto me, Lord. Moses is saying, this is what came from the word of God. And I want you to speak unto Aaron, say unto him. When thou lighteth the lamps, the seven lamps, that's the golden uh, candlestick, seven. Uh, we saw that in Exodus 25, 37. Shall give light over against the candlestick. So that candlestick is for light. It is to be lit by Aaron. And Aaron did so. And he lighted the lamps. So Aaron walks into this dark room. At that point, there's no there's no light inside that holy place. There's no light inside the outside holy place. That place is made with boards. It's got veils. I forget the complete thing, but there's there's sheepskin, there's ram skins, and there's badger skins. There's no light in there. Now let's, in fact, with that, he's walked into a dark room. I know we have all jokes about, you know, stubbing your toe against the table. There's a table there. But watch. Speak unto Aaron and say unto him, when thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps. We know that's the candlestick. We've read about it. We saw it made. Seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. And Aaron did so, and he lighted the lamps thereof over against 
the candlestick. Over against the candlestick. There, there, there's one. There, there's there's two possibilities. May, may not. Maybe four, more. Lamps. When Aaron. The oil lamps and maybe candles. The, that Aaron walks in there, and he's got that coal that comes off the altar. That's the only place in the fire, and that coal is lighting up. Or it could be God Himself lighting the place up. Because God is not going to have Aaron go into this place dark and start fumbling around. That's not God's way. God will not send you into a dark place if you want to be used by him. So there is another light in this room besides the candlesticks that will not be lit in no more. After Aaron lights the lamps. And when we go, when we went to, it was the second Samuel, I think it was, with Samuel, first Samuel. And we see in air that the light went out in the tabernacle. Because the word of God was precious in those days. And when you take that account of Samuel and what we're reading right now, the, the high priest lit that lamp. Well, Jesus, the high priest, said, I am the light of the world. And if the word of God is precious and you don't want it, Jesus Christ, in your life will go out. And then you'll stumble and fall in our darkness. What I'm trying to see, show you here is, at this point, the tabernacle has been built. Everything is set up. And, and God's already told Moses, okay, when you go have Aaron go in there, light that candlestick the first time. The one that's got the seven prongs. Seven holders, the oil lamp. And this work of the candlestick, and we're going to be reminded. Candlestick, 27 times from Exodus to November. Uh, November. Wow. Numbers. This is what it looks like in my note. I got an O. looks like a V. 27 times from Exodus to Numbers, you see candlestick. All right, you want you want to see something else? You want to see numbers and God, the Holy God? One of them smart Alex said, "I can't believe in God. There's not a God of mathematics." That oil that was used in that lamp was oil olive, trying to do what the Bible says. It's not olive oil; it's oil olive. Olive oil is anointing is a type of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is the part of the Trinity. So, when you get twenty-seven times the candlestick, three times. 9, if I'm correct, is 27 through the Spirit. Was beaten gold. Jesus Christ was beaten. Jesus Christ was given gold. Jesus Christ is the King of the Jews. You're not going to bring gold to God to buy your soul. You're going to bring the blood. Unto the shaft thereof. Unto the flowers thereof. It's ornamental. And yet only the priest will see it. So when we go run to the Gospels. And we open up the book of Luke. And we see John the Baptist's father in the holy place. And he's at that prayer incense altar. To offer the incense of prayer according to Revelation. And the people outside are praying. The only way he's getting light in that room is by this candlestick. Spoken way back in Numbers chapter 8, written by the high priest, which has been put out in Samuel. Which has been put out during the Babylon captivity. And who knows what was going on in the temple when Jesus was walking in. According unto the pattern which the Lord showed Moses. So he made the candlestick. Four verses about that candlestick. Then we're going to go back to the Levites. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. And thus, so here are men that are priests that are unclean. 
And if you're going to take a religion from priests, and there's a lot of religions that have priests, they're unclean. Because I guarantee you're not going to do the cleansing of the priests according to prescribed by God and get away with your Gentile ways. To, oh, no, wait a minute. you got to have Levitical priests if you want to jump in the Old Testament. And we don't even know who the, who the tribes of Israel are today. Never mind Levitical. But Hebrews proclaims to us, not only do we have a priest, but we got the high priest. We know his name. And we have his family recorded in Luke 3, or 2 or 3, and Matthew. Thou shalt do unto them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of purifying upon them. Oh, there's sprinkling come from. There's your water sprinkling. So when you do that baby sprinkling, is that a Levite? Or are you profaning the Bible? See, I found sprinkling the water. I found it. There it is. I need a Bible verse to say a sprinkle of the water. Numbers chapter 8, verse 7, but it's to Levites, priests. And let them shave all their flesh. Never seen that in a baptism. And let them wash their clothes. And so make themselves clean. Now, what are you going to do that with a baby? <laughs> Are you going to give a newborn infant child, not even a month old, you're going to give him a, a, a washboard and here, and wash your clothes, kids, for your bath? No. I've never seen godparents shave themselves. You know why they're godparents? Because for that child to be born again the way they are, that child can't speak and say, well, you know, I repent of my sin. That's where the godparents come in. The godparents will speak for that child and say this child will live their rest of their life forever in the will of God, repenting of the sins that they have done. Uh, that's crystal balling. That's fortune telling. And God says you're not to do that. And when it comes to sprinkling the water, there are the Levites. They're standing right there. They're full age. They know what they're doing. None of them is an infant by the close of this chapter. Let them take a young bullock with his meat offering, even fine flour mingled with oil. That's the meat offering. And another young bullock shall thou take for a sin offering. Now you want to have fun with your religion, and yes, in my mind, I'm I'm, poke, I'm poking at one specific religion, but there are many religions that have priests. And you're going to do your your baptism. I know they charge you. Walk in there with a cow and some fine flour with oil and say, okay, here's your payment. And see if they'll do the baptism. And yet there's the fee to the Levites to do their service for you. Prescribed by God. Today, baptism is not a means of salvation. This does not save the priests. They don't go to heaven because of what's going on here. They're just cleansed by God. Thou shalt bring the Levites before the tabernacle of the congregation. Thou shalt gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together. Okay, now we can see a baptism of the church today. You bring the congregation. You bring the people. It's to be outright done before all the people. A baptism of the church today comes after yourself. After you are born again. And have received Christ as your Savior. And you stand out before all that will witness. Look at me. And what the Levites are going around and saying, listen, I'm not like you people. I'm approved of God now. And with, as a Christian, they'll stand here. I'm not like some of you people. You may invite your unsaved family and unsaved whoever to come and say, listen, I'm standing out now. And I'll make a dedication before God to all the people here as present as my witness. I'm making a stand for God. This is not my salvation, but I am saying I am now a born again Bible believing Christian. And that day forth, you're supposed to walk clean. You're supposed to do right. 
You're supposed to do the Bible. Be doers of the Bible. And thou shalt bring the Levite before the Lord, Jehovah. And the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. You know, all the way up to here, the only time somebody ever put their hands on someone's head is you're going to kill the sacrifice you're going to offer the blood. You know what's going on right here? This is an ordaining. You're not going to kill the Levite. You are laying your hands on such as they, 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 Timothy, uh, Paul spoke about Timothy about laying on the hands of him, about the ordaining of, of, of elders in every city. That's what's going on here. They are ordaining and setting forth these Levites for the work of God. The children of Israel put their hands upon the Levites. The people who are laying their hands on the Levites are not the scholars. They're not people of colleges. They're not even men of the cloth. They are the congregation of the children of Israel saying, We approve of you to be set before us and guide us in whatever God has said. I've been asked many times, well, if God does give you work, I mean, does people have to lay hands on you and all that? Ordain you? And I answer always with the same question as far as two or three people I know of right now in the ministry. The ones that have already had some kind of ordaining will tell you, well, you, know, you need to be ordained. You need to be approved by me. And yet when they stepped into that church and they started that office, no one ever laid hands on them. And if you are chosen by God, as the Levites were of all the children of Israel, and the people have respected you, and has put on by God by laying their hands on you to be of God for them, their help and guide the shepherd. Now, this is not an office to take lightly, because now that now that this has happened, that Levite, that minister goes into, into the pulpit before the people. Now he has been chosen by the people and proclaimed by God. You are now responsible for everybody in that congregation. And where they lack, if you didn't tell them, according to Ezekiel, there'll be blood on your fingers. Now, if you tell them and they don't give heed, all right, that's their fault. They didn't want to listen. But you are now the instructor. You are now the guider, these Levites of the nation of Israel to do right. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord, the high priest, Jesus Christ, our high priest, before the world. Here are my Levites. Here are my people. Here are my instructors. What are they to do? Go in all the world and preach the gospel. You see how beautiful feet they are, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. That's Jehovah. And the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks. Now here comes the animal sacrifice. Now shall offer the one for a sin offering. We're all sinners. And the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord. The Lord said, ah, oh, I smell. That smells good. The Christians are doing right. Those that love the Lord, God says, I smell that. It smells so good. The Lord, to make an atonement for the Levites. Thou shalt set the Levites before Aaron, before his sons, and offer them for an offering unto the Lord. Now, they're not going to kill the Levites. They're not going to sacrifice them as they will do with their children later on to Moab. That's what the animal's job is. You can't go to God and say, God, I'm going to kill my firstborn. I'm going to kill a virgin. God says, I've already taken care of that. Well, uh, who? Jesus Christ. God, I'm, uh, uh, it's all over the Orient. People are going to walk up and down these, these stairs with glass and bloody their knees and break open the skin and muscles being ripped and they're doing it for penance of God say God look how what I'm doing I'm sacrificing my blood and God looks down and says I'm not taking it the blood that I approve of is God and notice when they give the Levites here 
to God, I want you to stress that the fact is they do not kill them. The animal took the place. And as far as us today in the church age, an animal took our place. The Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. You know, he's speaking about we were born in our hearts, in our conscience to worship God. I remember this, I just came to mind here, me and a friend, I think it was Kevin. We grew, for some reason, we, we would cut up earthworms and give them to God. It's like we knew something had to die. To please God. And when I grew up, it was, I, that turned from the earthworm, earthly and all, that turned to the Lamb of God, which was sacrificed and died for my soul, for my sins. I believe on him. And thou shalt set the Levites before Aaron and before his sons and offer them for an offering unto the Lord, and they don't die. Thou shalt separate the Levites from among the children of Israel. And the Levite shall be mine. Don't mess with a Levite. Don't mess with Israel. And as far as the Bible believing born again Christian. God says you are my son. God has become my father. And God spoke Jesus Christ to Paul and said. Why persecute thou me? God took it. Seriously, he took it for real. And when God looks at me, he says, that's my son. And when people mock, when I try to tell them about Jesus and I preach, you're not doing it to me. You're not bothering me. You're bothering God. He said, well, what's the thing here? Revelation chapter 1 says, I'm a priest of God. Now, I may not hold the title of Levi, but I hold the office of priesthood. Not to wear my collar on backwards, not to be called father or rabbi, but to be called the child of God by the Holy Spirit, by the finished work of Jesus Christ. I am God. Okay, as far as a Christian, thou shalt separate the Levites un from among the children of Israel. The Levites shall be mine. And that's what God says about me. That's my son. And when Satan comes up, the accuser of the brethren, Revelation, Job 1 and 2, he, he steps up to God and God says, it's my son. That's what he said about servant. You know Job, my servant? That's my servant. By the blood of Jesus Christ, as that office of priesthood, by the sacrifice of the high priest, Jesus Christ, God, the holy, almighty God, the Father, says, that's my son. He's mine. Have you ever, ever think, ever seen anything in the Bible where God has given up what he says is mine? Do you ever see God trading souls like, uh, like trading cards? Well, give me three players from that team and I'll give you four of these players. From this. No, God don't do that. When he says it's mine, it's mine. And when you see something that God has proclaimed as mine, and you see people start messing with it, you watch the anger of God, and then you watch the wrath of God. And after that, shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, we don't go in the tabernacle of the congregation. The Bible says in Corinthians, we are the tabernacle. We are the temple. And what is our service? Going out there telling people that there's a hell. And hell burns forever, the brazen altar. Get in there, wash our feet, wash our walk, because we get filthy when we walk. And that's the, the, the lather. Get in there, get in with the bread, read your Bible. You've got the light of the Holy Spirit to read your Bible. And you got that prayer in, uh, altar of incense. Pray. Stand before the throne, the mercy seat. We don't have a temple as they have a temple here, but we have the temple. And we do the office of the priesthood. And here it is, the service. So what do people in the world say about a church? Church services are at, and where do they even think they get the name service from? I don't know what they call it in the modern church today. Your service is right there. 
And it's not just when you're inside of, of a building. It's supposed to be all the time as a Christian. If you're a child of God, you are a, a and you are by Jesus Christ, and you are a priest, Revelation chapter 1, you are of God. You are a true Christian. Your service is 24 hours. Well, I'm not a pastor. You may have that, that co-worker call you 2 o'clock in the morning. I, I know you're one of the Christians. I'm sorry, but my child's right now in a hospital. It is your job right then and there. Say, let's pray right now. He may come up to you, tap you on the shoulder and say, uh, my wife's going for surgery. Can you pray for her? It's your job right then and there. Okay, let's pray right now together. Prayer is one of the services as a priest to God. There are all kinds of services for Christians. Telling people how to get saved. Trying to, trying to raise Christians up. Trying to get them to do right. And thou shalt cleanse them. Where do, you, where do you picture that one in the Bible? Jesus Christ took off took his garment, girded himself with a towel, and went about washing the feet of the disciples. And Peter, and you know the story, he said, listen, I'm not giving you a bath. This is not salvation. This is, you're going to get filthy in your walk. This is an illustration to you guys. This is the high priest now standing before the priest, Jesus and the disciples, I've said this for example. We're supposed to be clean by the washing of the word. You're supposed to read your Bible from Genesis, Exodus, and God said, you see that what you just read today? Wow, yeah, that's that's bad. That's you. Oh. Okay, close the book. No, that's not what's... Lord, how do I get right? For they are holy, not H-O-L-Y, holy given unto me. Says priest in Revelation 1, that's my account. We are charged with a good order for the nations. Going in all the world, nations, and preach the gospel. Tell them how and what to do. That's the job of the priest. Got Israelite comes walking up to the temple. He's got, he's got, a, he's got a, a, a ram in his hand. What do I need to do for what I'm, I'm bringing this for right now? What, and it's that priest job says, okay, this is what we need to do. And it's not for good smiley teeth and, and good friendly kind of thing you know if you take that ram home and let it mate with other other sheep and all that you're going to have multiples of sheep that levite that priest we ought to be honest and clean before the people holy given unto me from among the children of israel instead of such as open every womb now we read earlier matrix and God with Egypt, he killed every firstborn child that did not have the blood. Firstborn is a, a priority care of God amongst Israel. That's why God got so angry with Esau when he sold his birthright. God says every firstborn child of, of Israel, the 12 tribes, that's my son. And you better treat them right. You better give them to me. And the greatest example you got in the Old Testament of that is Hannah. That's her firstborn son. Jesus Christ is the firstborn and only begotten of God. Firstborn of Mary. Even instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel... Have I taken them unto me? God says, listen, I don't want you to bring all your children to me. I don't want you to have to give them. I enjoy what Hannah did. She did it from the heart. Eli, he had a problem with his first son. He had a problem with his second son. 
And what I'm going to do for the nation of Israel is I'm going to set apart one people. One group of people. And they're going to be your replacement. And if you didn't get what I just said, you missed something. I'm going to take a group of people, instead of you sacrificing your gold, your silver, your blood, your time, your hobbies. God says, I'm going to take one particular person. And that person, that firstborn person, is going to do something that's going to take over what you can do, what you cannot do. And that person is the firstborn of Mary, the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, is now had been taken out only by God for only the service of anybody else who comes out of that matrix, the womb. There's only one I will set. And it's remarkable that we get such a contrast when we get Anna because the priest, the Levite hood, is so perverted, so gross. And here's a woman, she's dying to have a baby, and her heart is so broken, and God is using... How can God put misery and pain in her life to help and protect Israel? Because had Hannah not been so heartbroken, she would not in her heart say, I'm going to give you my firstborn boy. And then when Mary comes along, you keep her, it pondered in her heart. She pondered these things in her heart. And run you back to Hannah and her broken heart. I think it says of Ephraim was Samuel. I believe he was of Ephraim. Ephraim, I mean, Samuel was not of the Levite tribe. Yet he stepped in and saved Israel from all their troubles and problems. Jesus Christ is not Levite. He's Judah, and he comes in, and if you will believe, if you will lay your hands and your finished work upon his merit, the gospel that he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried, and arose again according to the scriptures, the Levites were in charge of the scriptures. I'll take Jesus Christ as a sacrifice, and you can walk away free. Who? Barabbas. is the greatest picture. That dying thief. You have to be baptized. Really? Hold on. Time out. Hey, Roman. Hey, here, Herod. Oh, I got to be taken down. I got to be baptized, they say. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, right. He looked over and Jesus said, Jesus, you remember me in that kingdom? Jesus is today. That lamb was dying right there for that dying thief right there. And that lamb died before he died. And that dying thief, I don't know how it was in hell, but you just imagine off in hell. I hear the roasting lamb burning in hell right now. He's coming. <laughs> you wonder if, if he ever sparked up Abraham's bosom. That dying lamb, he's coming. <laughs> I don't know. Don't know. He would have been the last one to in Abraham's bosom. And maybe the first one to come out. <laughs> there he is. I've seen him. There he is. That's the one. He's coming right now. When the when the, the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they, oh, it's a spirit. Oh my! When he's walking across that gulf, that dying thing. There he is. That's the one, guys. Instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel, have I, God, taken them for me? So Jesus Christ is God. God has taken Jesus for us. And if you believe on Jesus, then you become mine, says God. For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I smoke every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. Now again, we're back in the Old Testament under Levitical priesthood. How can you proclaim this as a Gentile if you were never in Egypt suffering? You weren't. Israel was. But it has great application to the Christian. Oh, I'm, I'm sprinkled. Were you in your family, your father's Egypt, under penalty of uh, hardship and rigor? Uh, what are you talking about? I sanctify, set apart them 
for myself. That's God speaking. And I have taken the Levites for all the firstborn of the children of Israel. And I have given the Levites, oh, look at the word, as a gift. All right, ready? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Those Levites become priests because of Aaron. Now you are seeing the priests are a type of Christ. And to his sons. From among the children of Israel. To do this service. There's a, see Christian work is service. Too many people think it's liberty. If you are in liberty, as far as I remember, only like a week was the longest, unless it was medical emergency. Children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation to make an atonement for the children of Israel. That's what Jesus Christ did. He made an atonement not only for the children of Israel, but for all the world. The problem is when Jesus came, they rejected it. They rejected their high priest. They rejected their priest. They rejected the, the, the lamb. Paul got angry and said, I'm going to the Gentiles. They're believing more than you are. That there be no plague among the children of Israel. When the children of Israel come into the sanctuary. Huh? Come nigh unto the sanctuary. Come nigh unto, I, got a mark, I got one of my marks here. I can't. Come nigh unto the children of the sanctuary. That's one of the bad things about marking your Bible. They couldn't come into the sanctuary, but they can come up to that gate. And when they come to that gate, they're coming to God. Probably some of them are not coming to God, right? Because Malachi, you know, you bring your offer. I'm sick of it. But when they come nigh and they're truly coming with the right heart, they are expecting, and God is expecting that Levite to do what is proper and what is right. And I forget how to quote the verse completely. Won't want them to, to, to turn my children away, better for a millstone be tied about their neck. I didn't quote that verse completely. Lord, forgive me. But as a Christian, as priest revelation, we are to turn the people saved or lost to the right way. When they come nigh to the sanctuary. They can't come in the sanctuary, but the priest can. You may invite an unsaved person to church, but he's not in the church. And Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites according to According unto all that the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did the children of Israel unto him. So everything that was said was done. And the Levites were purified. Purified. They say today, if you buy bottled water and it says purified, stew may come out of the tap. You know what purify really is? It's when. God has done something like rain or snow or dew, and it has been untouched, unpolluted by man. You know what religion is? Religion is man-made. And if you've got a man-made religion, you're not purified because God didn't touch you. Now, when I came to Jesus Christ suffering and bleeding and dying on that cross, by God's blood, Acts 20, 20 I came and walked away purified because no other man had anything to do with the salvation. No other man had anything to do with the gospel. No other man had anything to do with the finished work of God but Jesus Christ alone. I was purified. And they washed their clothes. I get filthy after I've been purified. I sin after. 1 John 1 9. And Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord, and Aaron made atonement for them to cleanse them. Aaron, the high priest. Hebrews says the high priest is Jesus Christ. There he goes. You know what I'm atoned by? You know what I'm cleansed by? I'm cleansed by the high priest, Jesus Christ. 
And it may be their father, Aaron, but according to the church, the high priest that washed and offered me and cleansed me is my husband, Jesus Christ. I'm his bride. That's a more intimate love than a father and son. And after that, went the Levites to do their service in the tabernacle congregation. All right, so now the Levites are doing their priestly functions. Aaron has lit in that candle. The seven prongs are lit. He has done that work. And now the next thing, the priests are put into the service. There was no service until that light was lit. They rejected that light, Jesus Christ. And there's no Levitical priesthood going on today. At all. And not especially one that's pleasing to God. Read the book of Malachi. Before, before his sons, as the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did they unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is it that belongeth unto the Levites. From twenty-five years old and upward shall they go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So there is a time restriction for the Levites. Twenty-five years old, upward. And we read earlier in Numbers, we've also studied that at age 50, they were to retire from service. But even an aged Levite can do something. It may not be at the tabernacle. It may be in his hometown, his home city, wherever he is, to teach the people in that village where he lives. Or the children. No matter what your age is. You can be a 75 year old priest. Revelation chapter 1. In the nursing home. You can't get out and do nothing. You can lay there or sit there and pray to God. You can burn that incense altar. You know. Prayer is the most basic thing we got that God's given us. That, as far as I know, any and all Christians can do. You can do it blind. You can do it deaf. You can do it maimed. This is that belongeth unto the Levites from 25 years old and upward. They shall go in and wait. Wait. Waiters. Waitresses, and there's no women there, but that's where you get the name from. So when you run to Hebrew, uh, excuse me, when you run to the book of Acts, I think it's six. And the disciples, the apostles come out and say, it's not meet for us to weigh the tables. <laughs> Let's call for deacons to help the ministers. Deacons in the church are supposed to help that pastor so the pastor can get more time to reading and studying the Word of God and helping the people than running to the post office and running to the, the water bill. And but there's that service. There's that weight of the tabernacle of the congregation. And from age 50 years, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof and shall serve no more. In that tabernacle. But they can go home and help. They can pray. They can read. But as far as that tabernacle. They were priests from 25 years old to 50. But shall minister with their brethren, the Levites, in the tabernacle congregation. To keep the charge. And shall do no service. So see, they can still work. And shall the age of 50 years old, and from 50 years, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof, and shall serve no more, but shall minister with their brethren, the Levites, in the tabernacle congregation, 
There's no more service, but they're ministering. And that word minister amongst the church today has been so widely put to the garbage to the ground. Oh, Minister Smith, Minister such and such. Minister, you're still taking care of, you're still helping. But the minister here is, you've got a title, a duty, but you don't have the office no more. But you get back to this church and say, oh, we have a minister. Why, is he retired? No. Is he over 50? No, he's 30. He's a minister? Should be in service. <laughs> Military. Yes, sir. Going to go to battle. Yes, sir. You can't do the fight no more. Your broken body, your old age. Yeah, you know, then minister. Help the troops. Strengthen them. Teach them. In the time of the congregation, keep the charge. There's a military word. Charge. Orders. And shall do no service. So there's a difference between service and minister, and it's by age. Thou shalt do, that thou shalt, yeah, thou shalt thou do unto the Levites, touching their charge. So that's it. I mean, you're a Levite, you're 50 years old, and you're retired age, you don't go fly all the way down to Florida and then be of no use and never heard of anymore. You stand in and you help and you guide as the office of deacons were to be to the elders of the church. You served your time. You learned. You got experience. Now we can use that time. Now we can use that experience. If only the church would take practice to this. 